the clinical material that follows is disguised and the transcripts from sessions are based on my memories. I'll start by introducing one of the key reference points which underpins my clinical work. Renus Papadopoulos suggests that there are two Jungs, the one with an open epistemology and Socratic ignorance who was constructionist and relational, and the other who, following Gnostic epistemology, was in fact essentialist and universalist. I'm interested in the elements of Jung's work which are most epistemologically open and therefore most conducive to learning from a nuanced learning from the most impoverished and mad parts of my patients. In other words, they're ab okay. Okay, I'll run slightly over time, I warn you, but I will go slower. Um, in other words, their abject experience of their physicality and or interiority. Some case material. Leah, age 27, presented with a disorder of the self, borderline spectrum, bulimia nervosa, self-cutting and body dysmorphia. After about four years of analysis, Leah stopped being bulimic, and after about seven and a half years, she stopped cutting. Now, although these were extremely important changes, my focus here is on Leah's underlying struggle with self-hatred, which remained a powerful, constant aspect of her inner life long after her bulimia and cutting had ceased. <coughs> Vignette one, from a session towards the middle of Leah's fifth year in analysis. Her bulimia had stopped about a year ago, a year and a half ago, but she was still cutting at this stage. Leah talked about going for drinks with colleagues after work on Friday. She felt fat and awkward and ugly. On Saturday, she'd struggled all day with feeling flat and hopeless. In the evening, she'd become increasingly restless. Then it went blurry. She lost track of time and had a sense that she got into a really dark space. It felt awful, like some kind of huge pressure was building up and up. Something had to give. She remembered being in the bathroom with that weird, numb, distant, but too connected feeling. She described feeling like she was outside herself, with watching Razor Girl make a number of cuts on her thighs. Leah didn't have words for what she felt when she saw the blood, but afterwards there was a sense of relief of being able to be in herself again, but only for now. My comment to her. Sounds like you got overwhelmed by a kind of pressure and started to break up, the blurry bit. And the dark space sounds like you felt like you were really on your own. She nods. Me. Remembering how you've talked about these places before, I guess you were in that combination of numbness and everything hurting too much at the same time. Leah, yeah. But I just want to stop doing it. We keep talking about this stuff, but I can't stop it and I'm desperate. Me, reflecting inside myself on my counter-transference. My counter-transference field is dominated by a wave of panic and a feeling that I must come up with something to help Leah now. I'm aware that I've got no power to stop her cutting and I feel a wave of helplessness, frustration, anger and futility. I wonder whether Leah might be feeling overwhelmed by all this talk of a nightmare place inside her and is splitting to try to get away from it. I know from our work together that she's very ashamed of these places and desperately wants to be rid of them. This shame pushes her around a lot, and I have the sense that her just wanting it to stop comment may be being driven by this as well as her distress. Based on that working hypothesis, I try to find an image which might help her to hold this shamey, splitting, desperate, fragmenting place. My next comment takes its shape from Jung's view of the psyche as healthily dissociable, and Andrew Samuels' observation that Jung worked with the psyche by personifying its contents. So I say to Leah, look, my guess is that as we're talking, it's like there are two bits of you pulling in different directions. One bit's hugely distressed and feels ashamed and confused about the blurry, dark places it goes to, and she merges into Razor Girl. She cuts because she knows that that will break the pressure build-up and give you some relief. But I imagine another bit of you just wants the whole nightmare to stop, the whole cutting nightmare to stop, it wants me to stop talking with you about it and do something to make it stop now, forever. And then I'm kind of wondering inside myself whether Leah might need a bit more from me to help her manage the shame of us having this conversation at all. So I add, trouble is, I think both are bits of you, and I'm actually interested in what it's like to be each of those bits. I have a hunch, though this might sound a bit weird, that if you could get rid of the cutting bit, you'd lose something important. Leah tearing up, I hate her, I hate Razor Girl, 
I'm weird, sick, crazy, I hate being me, a stupid, fat, useless piece of shit. I just want it all to stop. So, maybe me saying I'm interested in what it's like to be both of it, bits of you makes it more painful, perhaps almost unbearably so. By now, Leah's crying and she says, yes, it's like you want me to go to the dark place and I just want to get rid of it. Me. Like my saying that I'm interested in both bits of you creates huge tension. The desperate bit wants the nightmare place and cutting to just stop. And the idea of me being interested in the cutting bit seems mad and cruel. If I tried to imagine what it's like to be the desperate bit, I'd be screaming at me, Sue, just do something. Do something to get rid of all this stuff now, please. But I'm also aware that Razor Girl has a whole world inside her. And painful as it is, I think it'd be wrong of me to get rid of her for you, even if I could. Leah's still crying, but I just want her to go away. Sue, would she go? Leah, very quietly. No, she's strong and she won't go. So, what about some middle ground? I know you really want rid of Razor Girl, but my hunch is that if we can slow stuff down enough and get to know a little bit about her world, that kind of compul compulsive can't not do it thing that happens with cutting might very slowly ease down a little bit. Like if we get to know Razor Girl a little, both she and you might find little bits of room to move or make choices about the massive pockets of pressure that build up. How about we try and imagine that you and I are sitting here together and Razor Girl's with us. I know she's there, well we know she's there and so does she, but she's a bit of a way off and we can sit like this for as long as we need to. Leah cries for a while and says, yeah, okay. My sense is that her tone is of sadness, exhaustion, resignation. But there's also a bit of relief, maybe, that I'm prepared to stay in this field of tensions with her. The point that I'm trying to make here is that even this, at this point, some years into the work with Leah, I still don't know what Leah's self-hatred and cutting are about. I've got loads of ideas, but I don't know. But I can assume that they're multi-layered complex communications, and I'm prepared to wait for as long as it takes and work as slowly as necessary for any clues about their possible meaning to emerge. And this is my attempt to, supply, to apply what I talked about earlier as Jung's position of Socratic ignorance. Vignette two. From a session early in Leah's ninth year of analysis, about three and a half years later, she'd stopped cutting about 16, 18 months ago at this stage. Since stopping cutting, Leah's self-hatred was now much more present in the room. And I often had a sense that we were quite close to, and sometimes actually inside, the pockets of her inner world which was psychotic in intensity. Had I previously attempted to talk with Leah about these places and the thoughts or images associated with them, she would have been overwhelmed with panic and shame and would have probably dissociated. Now, however, she was increasingly able to stay present and she often found relief in our joint attempts to put usually very broken up words together around our experiences of them. Nonetheless, I was aware that some of my countertransference material was still as yet too strong to be spoken about, even indirectly. For example, in a session where Leah's self-hatred was in full flood, I got a strong image of her having grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and forced me to my knees on some concrete pavement. There was shit on the pavement in front of me, which I somehow knew to be human. And Leah was screaming at me to eat it. I did not eat it, even though she was becoming more and more furious. I was terrified that she was going to start to smash my head against the ground any second and not be able to stop. As I say, it's a counter-transference image, but sitting with it in the session, was quite hard going. I wondered about many aspects of this image, especially Leah's repeated comments about herself as a piece of shit. These wonderings took me to an impasse. In hindsight, I can see that while I wanted to stay with Jung's position of Socratic ignorance, his responses to shit, and especially abandoned shitty babies in his own writings, troubles me. Specifically, in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Jung writes about an interaction with a potential trainee. Jung describes the man as an entirely normal doctor, and Jung really labours the point of this man's normalcy heavily, to the point of being a bit dismissive, in fact. Jung explains to him that he will need an analysis in order to learn to know himself, and the doctor replies, I have no problems to tell you about. Jung writes, that should have been a warning to me. So I said, very well, then we can examine your dreams. I have no dreams, he said. You will soon have some, Jung responded. <laughs> At last, an impressive dream turned up. Jung's potential trainee dreamt that the train he was on stopped in a certain city. This was later established to be Zurich, where Jung was working. 
Since he did not know the city and wanted to see something of it, the doctor set out towards the city centre. There he found a medieval building, probably the town hall. He wandered down its long corridors and came upon handsome rooms, their walls lined with fine paintings, old paintings and fine tapestries. Suddenly he saw it had grown darker, the sun had set. He thought, I must get back to the railway station. At this moment he discovered that he was lost, no longer knew where the exit was. He started in alarm, simultaneously realising that he'd not met a single person in this building. He began to feel uneasy and quickened his pace, hoping to run into someone, but he met no one. Then he came to a large door and thought with relief, that is the exit. He opened the door and discovered he had stumbled upon a gigantic room. It was so huge and dark that he could not even see the opposite wall. Profoundly alarmed, the dreamer ran across the great empty room, hoping to find the exit on the other side. Then he saw precisely in the middle of the room something white on the floor. As he approached, he discovered that it was an idiot child of about two years old. It was sitting on a chamber pot and had smeared itself with faeces. At that moment, he woke with a cry in a state of panic. Now, William Meredith Owen is also interested in this text from Memories, Dreams, Reflections. And in his paper, Jung's Shadow, Negation and Narcissism of the Self, Meredith Owen discusses it in relation to Donald Winnicott's review of Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Having quoted Jung's text, Meredith Owen comments on it, saying, what an extraordinarily powerful image of utter uncontainment this is. The abandoned child, not in the sunlit royal halls, but in the terrifyingly unbound dark interior of the absent breast, becomes the idiot child, unable to contain his own thoughts or retain his own feces. Now, I share Meredith Owen's unease at Jung's response to his patient's dream, but as will, em as will emerge, I understand this unease differently. Meanwhile, however, Jung, Jung continues talking about this doctor. He says, I, kn I knew all I needed to know. Here was a latent psychosis. I must say I sweated as I tried to lead him out of that dream. I had to represent it to him as something quite innocuous and gloss over all the perilous details. What the dream says is, this is Jung still, what the dream says is approximately this. The trip on which he sets out is a trip to Zurich. He remains there, however, only for a short time. The child in the centre of the room is himself as a two-year-old child. In small children, such uncouth behaviour is somewhat unusual, but still possible. They may be intrigued by their faeces, which are coloured and have an odd smell. Raised in a city environment and possibly along strict lines, a child might be easily be guilty of such a failing. But the dreamer, the doctor, is no child. He is a grown man, and therefore the dream image at the centre of the room is a sinister symbol. When he told me the dream, I realised that his normality was a compensation. I had caught him in the nick of time, for the latent psychosis was within a hand's breadth of breaking out and becoming manifest. This had to be prevented. Finally, with the aid of one of his other dreams, I succeeded in finding an acceptable pretext for ending the training analysis. We were both of us very glad to stop. Now, my concern is Jung's Gnostic certainty about his insights. The certainty of his interpretation of latent psychosis and the sense of his urgent need to get rid of the abandoned shitty baby could just as easily be read as an indication that this is a realm of physicality and interiority within his patient and himself where he found it impossible to hold on to his own position of Socratic ignorance. Redfern, Redfern points to something of this in Jung's work when he comments on Jung's apparent avoidance of some bodily aspects of oneself, e.g. the anal aspects, together with his avoidance of the ignoble, even the banal. Now, given that my task is to gather together elements of analytic discourse which support my efforts to maintain a position of Jungian Socratic ignorance with Leah, this means I need to look for another discourse to support this epistemological openness towards shit and abandoned shitty babies, or in Leah's case, the patient, patient who feels like a piece of shit. Now, at this point, as I say, Meredith Owen turns to object relations, but my choice is different. For me, object relations offers an extremely valuable network of metaphors for thinking about primitive states of mind and body, but I also experience it as shot through with a kind of identity politics, which intrudes on the political, uh, the, that's interesting, in the clinical situation in a way that I personally find unacceptable. In order to flesh this point out, I'm going to build on Andrew Samuels' critique of what he refers to as the object relations consensus, by which he means that there is an interplay between con unconscious fantasy and potential on the one hand and the good enough personal facilitating environment on the other. 
Samuels points out a number of biases and assumptions in the object relations consensus. Here I'm going to summarise two which bear most strongly on my not using it as a key point of reference in my thinking about Leah's abject interiority. First, object relations is biased towards wholeness, so that stress is placed on the way that part objects do or do not evolve into whole objects. As Samuels puts it, part objects in, in, in the object relations discourse, part objects are undervalued in and for themselves. Experientially, part objects are often sources of feelings of wholeness. And scanning part objects for signs of movement towards whole objects suggests that object relations discourse is in the grip of a maturational morality and a fantasy of wholeness, just as normative as Freud's strictures on love and work are about genitality. Samuels continues, object relations has a particular problem in its refusal to take the emergence of persons in the inner world as other than a kind of part object madness, or at best, immaturity. Sometimes part objects do develop into subpersonalities, and they do perform as persons inhabiting the inner world and functioning therein. For example, as messengers. One can engage in valuable dialogue with these inner persons. What is crucial here is that these trickster-like states of mind have to be valued just as they are, no matter the object constancy is absent. Now, my own experience is that this maintenance of a Socratic ignorance and openness to part objects on their own terms is crucial when working with people like Leah. Such patients are often, again in my experience, hyper alert to the other's judgement of them. And my concern is that this underlying pressure towards whole object relating, which Samuels identifies as central to the object relations consensus, can be deeply shaming. Like Samuels, I'm also concerned that these dynamics have a powerful, unconscious, normalising effect. Fragmented pockets of aliveness and insight in a patient can easily be lost in favour of a false wholeness. And this can be especially so if these pockets present in ways that seem to be mad or pathological. Second, as Samuel says, no analyst would claim that the mother-infant relation is the only important relationship. But there certainly seems to be a powerful hierarchy in the object relations consensus to the extent that it can be really hard to find space to think about any rela other relationship as powerful in a person's conscious and unconscious landscape. Now this is important for my thinking about Leah because although we spent a lot of time exploring her relationship with her mother and you know how it was around in our relationship parallels etc and how it affected her other relationships, it was her relationship with her father that turned out to be pivotal in her self-hatred. Like Gladstone Hinton, I find Jean Laplanche's work offers a vital model of the psyche which is comparatively free of these kinds of identity politics. Alison Stack summarises Laplanche's model of the psyche and the development of the unconscious as follows. She says, according to Laplanche, when infants attempt to metabolise, assimilate or read the various gestures and utterances of their caretakers, there will always be an excess, something that exceeds this helpless creature's limited capacity to assimilate. This metabolic excess is crucial because it is this excess that comes to constitute the unconscious and thus shape each individual's psyche. In other words, those aspects of the adult message that the infant cannot translate, metabolise or assimilate are repressed in the form of an internal foreign body, a psychical other. Thus the unconscious is an alien inside me and even one put inside me by an alien. Laplanche describes these messages that the infant cannot translate, metabolize, metabolize or assimilate as enigmatic signifiers or enigmatic messages. These messages are doubly compromised, he writes. That is, they are opaque to their recipient and their transmitter alike. In other words, they're not puzzles or riddles that can one day be solved by learning and applying the proper codes. These enigmatic signifiers are addresses that lack a signified while remain, retaining an interpretive function. In other words, an enigmatic signifier does not signify of, but it does signify to. And hopefully you'll get a bit more of a sense of what I'm talking about there as I unpack a bit. Now this understanding underpinned how I worked with Leah. Even though I often felt like I was drowning in what her self-hatred signified of, Jung's position of Socratic ignorance, where fragments of meaning might emerge from symptoms of madness, means that I was able to stay with the possibility that Leah's self-hatred signified too. In other words, it pointed to something. It was trying to express something. 
As such, Lear's self-hatred retained what Stack describes as an interpretive function. It was a communication. Paying attention to this helped me try to avoid a pattern which Laplanche identifies as the predominant human instinct, which is to domesticate the enigma of, this, the, of the other. In this process, the dominant tendency is always to relativise the discovery, to reassimilate and reintegrate the alien. In this situation, the receiver of an enigmatic message is not translating the enigma of the message itself. Rather, she is simply translating her old translations. Most people respond to enigmatic texts by attempting to domesticate the enigma of the other and to close off the psychic threat that alterity poses to the self. This observation builds on Laplanche's distinction between translation and interpretation, which Ladson Hinton describes as follows. He says, interpretation makes knowledge of some factual situation. Much interpretation has the purpose of giving a falsely comfortable sense of recognition, rediscovery of what we already know. Based on these perspectives, I tried to retain a sense of Leah's self-hatred as an expression of an unconscious, enigmatic inner otherness around which she was organised. Again, my task was to not domesticate those enigmas, but to provide a space in which aspects of them might over time be glimpsed. Vignette 3. This is taken from a session towards the end of Leah's 11th year of analysis, about three years later. Working in this way, Leah and I reached a point where the voice of her self-hatred began to lose some of its concrete, absolute authority. Leah was now a couple of years into a stormy but warm relationship with a man. When they were out together one weekend, Leah heard herself think, you know, it's a shame you aren't pretty. It would be so much nicer for him if you were. What stood out for her was the soft, kindly, comforting tone of this inner voice as if it was trying to soothe an anxious child. And we were both curious about how different this was from her traditional berating self-hater voice. In the discussion that emerged, Leah was shocked to realise that this, the most comforting voice that she had ever noticed inside herself, was actually vicious. Again, my focus here is on models of the psyche which support Jung's position of Socratic ignorance in relation to Leah's thought and her capacity to notice it which was amazing, the fact that she actually got this on screen, as it were. Hinton summarises aspects of Laplanche's understanding of the analytic tasks which support this focus, and he writes, the analyst tends to be seen as the one supposed to know. In order for the process to evolve, it is crucial that the analyst remain in touch of his or, with his or her own enigmatic core. By refusing to know, or more accurately, being aware that he or she does not know, the analyst provides a hollow, in which the process can evolve. In this basic hollow, two usually entwined types of transference come to rest. One is the reproduction of forms of behaviour, relationships and childhood images. This is, as Laplanche calls it, the filled-in transference. It's got loads of stuff in it. The other dimension of transference concerns elements in the relationship that have an enigmatic character. This latter is the hollowed-out transference. In practice, these are usually mixed. The enigma is the means that enables the analysis to take place, the lysis part of the analysis. And the impact of the enigma may create a kind of opening, a gap, a crack, a cleavage plane in the ordinary filled-in process of things. If not for the enigma, there would be no analytic work and no dismantling of old patterns. Seen in this light, my task was not to be the one who knew, not interpret Leah's material, not look for signs of emerging whole objects in it or in our relationship either. As Clark puts it, my task was to sit in the shit with Leah. Doing so does not guarantee change. However, what does sometimes emerge for the analysand is a capacity to sit in the pointless place with another. That in turn, as Hinton indicates through Laplanche, can make space for the possibility of a crack opening up in the ordinary filled-in process of things. That's part of how I understand Leah's sudden breakthrough capacity to hear her self-hateful inner voice in a totally different way. This was a turning point. It opened up the possibility of her being able to sit with the shamed, shitty baby parts of herself on their own terms, without feeling she had to get rid of them or clean them up or herself in order to pass as normal or to be well. Again, Laplanche's understanding of the analytic task fits closely with my reading of Jung's position of Socratic ignorance. Both are the antitheses of Gnostic claims of authority or insight. 
What emerged over the following year was that from as early as Leah could remember, she'd experienced her father as a profoundly disappointed, alienated man. As we explored this, she recalled how, as a child, she'd felt totally overwhelmed and helpless around him. After further reflection and a number of dreams, she began to develop a sense that she'd tried to master these feelings by assuming that she was the source of her father's deep disappointment. What also emerged, what she also kind of pieced together, was that living herself through the prism of this internalisation of her father's unbearable loneliness and disappointment was the nearest and indeed only thing she had to love or relationship with him. At a deep level, she had to see herself through this prism. She had to hate herself accordingly and enact that self-hatred through bulimia and cutting if she was to have any sense of connection to him. I want to underline that, that the cutting and the bulimia and the self-hatred was love to dad. It was loyalty, it was an attempt to draw close to him. It's the only one she had. To let that go was unbearable, unthinkable and unsurvivable. In this context, it felt right for me to raise my earlier counter-transference counter image of Leah trying to force me to eat shit. She described her sense that one of her father's unconscious demands was, eat my shit and that's how I'll know you love me. I wondered about this as part of my sense of the importance of the concrete of the pavement in my image and about Leah's bullying role in this image. In other words, Dad's concreteness within Leah as part of his shit that she was loyal to. Thinking about my image, Leah and I wondered if one of the nightmarish dilemmas which had shaped our relationship was that on the one hand, she desperately, desperately wanted me to eat her shit in order to show her that that's what people do, that it's all right for her to give in and do that for her father. On the other hand, it was essential that I didn't eat it. My sense was that she wanted me to love slash eat her shitty object, whose love she was desperate for, and was prepared to bully me ruthlessly in order to try to make me do so, as she bullied herself ruthlessly. There was nothing she was trying to do to me that she wasn't already doing to herself. At the same time, it was essential that I hate this bullying and refuse to eat her shitty object, as to do so would have been to have make, made it or her, and or her father's demands acceptable. Briefly, by way of a kind of one-paragraph conclusion, in this presentation, I've been exploring how I used elements of Jung's early work in combination with Laplanche's ideas on analysis and the psyche to work with Leah. The common ground between these two theories is that they both locate the analyst not knowing as central to the process of offering an analytic space in which the patient can come to glimpse something of the enigmas around which they are organised. These glimpses and the cracks that they reveal can lead to significant changes in the patient's experience of themselves and the world around them. How am I doing for time? Have I got two seconds? No, got, got two seconds. Great. Okay, because the other bit that I wanted to add is that there was a, and it's about three paragraphs, was that eventually Leah found, made a connection to an image which gave her part of the room in this, and it was, it was part of the thing that gave her the capacity to think about the inner voice saying, you know, it's a shame you're not pretty, it would be so much nicer for him. What had happened at the beginning of our work was that We'd been negotiating how many times a week she was going to come. And I'd suggested four. She freaked out at that. Um, and we ended up on three times a week. But one of the images that I used to try and help her understand frequency was that I said, look, if you're going to redecorate a room, if you're just going to repaint, then drop sheets and ladders and a few planks, you can probably get away with it on. If you're going to move structural walls, you've got to put up scaffolding. And coming three or four times a week is putting up scaffolding if you're going to do a bigger job. And that image had worked for her, and as I say, we agreed on three times a week. But what clicked with her was that she took it as, and Australians can tell this about me, that I'm kind of English working class. I'm a Londoner, even though I've lived in Australia for 26 years. And she had a sense that that, one of the things that eventually surfaced in her kind of making this click around having more space was the sense that she could leave her father with me. Her father was a very practical man, and her sense was that she could leave him with me as she withdrew and stopped practicing the self-hatred that was loyalty to him, she was not leaving him utterly abandoned on his own, that she could make use of this thing. I would never think of as therapeutic about me at all. Um, but she could make use of my kind of practical working class pragmatism as somebody that she could leave dad with and he wouldn't turn his nose up at and go, oh, kind of thing. And the idea of not, leave, not having to leave dad on his own completely and betray him in the process was the sense of what gave her that room. So amazing in terms of how other people make use of it. Thank you.